This is perhaps the most famous data visualization out there. It's Charles Minard's map of Napoleon's invasion of Russia in 1812 and 1813. It shows data about life and death. It's elegant and minimal, and it's often said that it tells a story. What makes this chart so famous? What does it include and what does it leave out? And what does that mean for our understanding of the chart, the underlying data, and the war it depicts? Let's take a look. Minar's chart describes the progress of Napoleon's army in what is called the Russian Campaign, the invasion of Russia in 1812 and 1813. This was a disastrous war, and Minar shows that very pointedly by focusing on the number of men in the French army as time progresses. I'm calling this the French army here, even though about half of it wasn't actually French soldiers, but German, Polish, Austrian, and so on. The most obvious feature of the chart is this tan-colored ribbon going left to right, and this is actually on top of a stylized map. The ribbon goes from a place called Kovno, or Kaunas, in what is today Lithuania, to Moscow. The width of the ribbon shows the number of men in Napoleon's army. It starts with 422,000 at the beginning, and by the time they arrive in Moscow, they're down to 100,000. That's more than three out of four men not making it to Moscow. The ribbon then goes back from Moscow and it changes color here from tan to black. And again, the width is the number of men, starting with the 100,000 in Moscow, getting narrower and narrower, and eventually dropping down to only 10,000 who made it out. Remember, we started with 422,000 here, so this means that out of every 42 men in Napoleon's army, only one came back. There's an additional line chart at the bottom, which aligns with the black ribbon and is connected to it with a few lines. This chart shows temperatures for a few days during that time, which was the winter of 1812-1813. Because it's connected to the black ribbon, it also reads right to left. The scale used here is the rear mirror scale, which, like the Celsius scale, is defined by the freezing and boiling points of water, but using slightly different numbers. All the temperatures you see on this chart are at or below freezing, with the coldest at negative 30 rear mirror, which is negative 24 in Celsius, or 11 below in Fahrenheit. The cold certainly cost many lives during the war, and there are harrowing tales of men falling down on the side of the road and just freezing to death with nobody able to help them. But it was far from the only cause of death. There was also the abysmal supply situation, and, of course, the war. Part of what makes this chart so appealing is its simplicity. It's just a few simple shapes showing a few dozen data points. It's elegant in its minimalism. But things are much more complicated and way messier. Here's a different view. It's a recreation of a chart from a Soviet military encyclopedia from the 1980s. The French army wasn't a single block, but consisted of many different battalions and companies and so on, under different commanders. And then there were the Russians. There was the regular army, but also various militias, notably the Cossacks, but also many others. They attacked, retreated, attacked again. There were several large battles along the way, notably in Smolensk and Borodino, which aren't visible at all in Minar's chart, and, and there were of course many small ones as well. And that was just the invasion. The retreat was easily as messy. The Russians forced the French to go back largely the same way they had come, which meant that they couldn't find food because all that land had already been plundered. This is perhaps the earliest example of what's now called scorched earth policy. And again, there were battles, there were many different groups involved in many different places. They pursued the French and decimated them down to almost nothing. Minar focuses on the French side, and that makes sense to keep things simple. But think about what we're not seeing in his chart. The other half of the conflict, arguably more than half. And the numbers are just staggering. According to various sources I've looked at, there were actually closer to 700,000 French soldiers and around 800,000 Russian soldiers, between the army and the various militias. And they weren't the only ones involved. There were also scores of civilians that were killed in the conflict or starved to death after the land had been plundered by the various armies. All told, there's an estimated 1 million people who died in this war. We don't know much about what Minar had actually in mind with his chart that was created only a few months before his death. 
but even just shortly after it was published, people started to see it as a stark comment on war in general and the tremendous cost of this specific war. Minar very clearly spelled out in the description at the top what it shows and where he got his numbers, but not what his message was supposed to be. One of the problems with this graphic is that it invites the telling of stories. A lot of people say it tells a story. And one of the stories that people like to tell is that of the crossing of the Beresina River, which is where Napoleon lost about half of his men. So the story goes that there was ice on the river and the, the soldiers were trying to cross, but they broke through the ice and almost half the soldiers were lost at that point by falling through the ice. The problem was that the river wasn't frozen, so the French had to build bridges while battling the Russians. In fact, this was a major battle that extended for many miles along the river as they were desperately trying to get the bridges ready so they could cross, and then had to defend them because the Russians of course tried to destroy them to cut them off. Here are a couple of paintings I found that illustrate this particular crossing. Notice the river in the background and the lack of ice on the river. These stories are deceiving in their simplicity and because they appear plausible. It was winter, it was cold, it was Russia, so why wouldn't there be ice on the river? But that's just not what happened. And we need to be very careful when basing such stories on what is really zero evidence in this case. All we know is that the French army suffered drastic losses at this point, but we know nothing about what happened, at least not from Minar's chart. This is a very famous chart, and it's basically a given that it will be shown in any visualization class and in many talks about data visualization. But what's odd about that is just how unique a chart it is. And by unique, I mean singular and specific, as opposed to general and widely applicable. A colleague of mine calls this a hapax legomenon, which usually means a word that only occurs a single time in a given context, like in a book, for example. In this case, it's a chart type that doesn't have many uses other than this specific one. We might also call it a one-off or a singleton. It's quite fortunate that Napoleon invaded Russia and not the other way around. The chart reads very easily for the majority of people who are used to reading left to right. The large ribbon with its arrow-like shape clearly points that way and it moves mostly west to east. This makes it easy to read as a motion and as a progression. Will it work as well for a more winding path? Or for a journey that wasn't going west to east, left to right? Well, let's find out. As famous as the Napoleon chart is, this other one is not nearly as well known. In fact, I don't think many people know that it was also drawn by Charles Minard on the same sheet of paper as the Napoleon one. It even carries the same date, November 20th, 1869. It shows the progression of another army, that of Hannibal, in about 220 BCE from southern Spain into what is now northern Italy. It shows the number of men in Hannibal's army, 94,000 at the beginning and 26,000 at the end. It's the same kind of chart, similar subject matter, same style, same artist even, and yet virtually nobody has heard of it. Hannibal didn't travel from west to east. Are you seeing a left to right progression here? Well, you are, but look at that arrow pointing north. Minar had to rotate that map quite a bit to make it work. It's a far cry from the great match that the technique is for the Napoleon map. This chart is unique and famous in a way that William Playfair's early bar and line charts, for example, are not. Playfair's charts are very widely applicable, so the specific first line chart or bar chart isn't really all that important. These chart types work for lots of data and we use them all the time. But Minar's ribbon, or flow map, or whatever you want to call it, is the only one of its kind that really works. People have tried to apply it to other data, but none of the ones I've seen work very well, or really at all. Is this the best chart ever? I don't think that there is one single best chart. Is it Minar's best chart? That's a more reasonable question, but most people don't know enough of Minar's work to make that call. And I think we're really doing Minar a disservice by trying to elevate one thing he created as some sort of platonic ideal. Minar was a civil engineer, and after he retired, he started drawing charts and maps. 
He created over 60 that we know of, most of them maps, but all of them quite innovative in their own ways. There's a lot more where that Napoleon chart came from, if only we can stop being so insanely focused on that one piece. It's a beautiful and elegant chart, and it has a very modern feel to it. Minard was certainly ahead of his time with his work in 1869. And it's likely that his intention was to send a message about the horrendous human cause of that particular war, and perhaps war in general. We don't know that, but it seems like a reasonable interpretation. I think we can learn a lot from a more critical appreciation of this chart, and from understanding it in its context. On its own, it's a great piece that makes us ask questions. What happened? How did all these people die? What did they fight for? And I think that should be its value. Not that we make up stories, but that it makes us want to know more about what actually happened. To me, that makes for a much more valuable chart than one that supposedly has all the answers. Thanks for watching and take care. Okay, this is just rambling.